View from the Gutters, episode 27. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. In today's episode, we discuss A Tale of Sand, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 5407. Are we ready? Yeah, we're ready now. Okay. All right, I, welcome. I'm not ready. Now? No, I'm ready. Okay. <sighs> All right, welcome to... Wait, now I'm all thrown off. Oh, Jesus Christ, Okay, guys. no, wait, right. I'm good, I'm ready. View from the Gutters, episode 27. That's Amanda. three squared. <laughs> no, it's three cubed. You fucked it up. <laughs> it's three cubed! Uh, you didn't let him finish uh, saying what three, his name was. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm Andrew Shard. I'm Joe Pretty. I'm Tobias Panchin. And I'm Cade Reynolds. 27 is not three cubed. It is three cubed. It's not. Three times three is nine times three is 27. Times three is no, 81. Three times three is nine. Not, yes. Three cubed is nine. Three. Uh, that's. That's three squared. So that's, that's three times. What do we do if I commit murder on the podcast? Does that make you guys accessories or um, what? Because you might want to leave and just forget I said anything. And this is well, why you're in cookie jail. Depends. I'm aggression not issues. in fucking cookie jail. All right? you are in I have jail. all the fucking cookies. And I'm not giving them to you, motherfuckers, for that's for sure. <laughs> so what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about cookie jail. No one has we're any talking, idea what you guys are talking, talking about. about cookie jail. In, in the space where we record... Joe's Chard trapped. has has put a table across, and it effectively traps me where I sit. And last time we recorded, he had made cookies, and I desperately wanted a cookie, and I could not have one. So Chard said I was in cookie jail, and now they're never letting me forget it. Well, because well, you're the in first, cookie jail, jail every time. And the first rule about cookie jail is you don't talk about cookie jail. Well, I just you violated it. I now. just ruined. fucking talked about cookie jail. You've ruined all the mystery of cookie fuck jail. Fuck cookie jail and fuck the rules about cookie jail. That's secret, all I'm saying. Secret government program to that's, keep Joe away I'm from saying. cookies. That's what I'm saying. That I am, the, I am the cookie jail Edward Snowden. You're, you're going to have to go in the cookie hole. That's... I'm going to go in your fucking cookie <laughs> hole. <laughs> I, I don't want to know where this is going. Uh, it's gonna really be, I can already feel that it's going to be one of those nights. I'm really glad this is not a video show. <laughs> I'm also very glad. I, I have to say, you you seem to be feeling pretty rambunctious tonight. I Well, I've been listening to Zero Punctuation for the last like, fucking four hours, so I'm, and I'm ready to go. I'm really sweaty. Like, <laughs> yeah. There might be something really wrong is. with me. I think. I might be sick. I don't know. Like something's not no right. No one else is sweating, but you're dying. I know is that like, I'm really attracted to you right now. I'm not else. having a good day. I was actually dehydrated earlier today. Uh, got pretty bad, and I had to just dunk my head in the sink full of water. That sounds refreshing. It nice. does sound refreshing. I, I took a shower today, and it was refreshing. I wish I wasn't in cookie jail. I hope that I'd you be... take a refreshing shower most days. I do most days, but today especially. Some days are not more. They're not refreshing as much as just like the shit. Thing. I'm late for everything. Get in the shower. Like, oh my god, something's growing on my body. Let's go take a shower. <laughs> uh. Well, the shower's probably not going to help that. You should probably, no, no, that's true. That's probably true. see a doctor, Joe. It's usually when like the the insects flying around my head just start dropping, and I'm like, oh, we should probably go shower. You should probably see a doctor about that other thing. No, I, that, nothing's no? growing on me except the prehensile tail. But well, we've seen that. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, we know what that's from. That's that's, that's, that's just the thing. secret government programs of experimenting on that's, cookie jail prisoners. That's what it is. <laughs> free free jail. Free Joe. Free Joe. Solidarity. So, so, so. We're talking about Jim Henson's Tale of Sand, which uh, is an adaptation of his lost screenplay, and it was by uh, Jim Henson and Jerry Jewell. And it's uh, realized by Ramon K. Perez, who I think is. Uh, does the whole. It handles the entire adaptation. And, uh, yeah. Let's. Uh, who wants to start? You recommended it. Did I'll you, start. Did you like I, it? Yeah, I fucking love it. I actually bought this. Um, I had been in the comic store several times, and I had picked it up and looked at it and been like, no, nah, maybe I'm not going to do it, maybe I'm not going to do it. And then finally I had a little bit of extra money, and I was like, you know what? Oh, fuck it, I'm going to get it. I think uh, a friend of ours recommended it to uh, to me, and I, was, I just kind of didn't have an excuse not to buy it anymore. So I bought it. And I was uh, very taken with it. Uh, there's not a lot of dialogue, which I like. 
um, the story speaks for itself. It's very stream of consciousness. It's very, um, uh, you're, you're kind of, you're, there's a lot of imagery going on. So you have to kind of, you're put in a position to kind of, you have to pay attention to what's going on. You can't just scan it, otherwise you're going to get lost really easily. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, Perez kind of switches between, um, like, what looks like watercolors and just, like, very more comic book style art to, to being more like a painted look uh, from less realistic and more cartoony to much more realistic. Uh, the backgrounds are all, like, the color palette he uses is very striking and changes from page to page and sometimes from panel to panel. Uh, it's just, I really just enjoy, it's a treat for the eyes. Um, figuring out, one of the reasons I wanted to recommend it is because I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get some other takes about what it's about because it's really kind of, you know, it's, I think it's difficult because it's, it seems to be a very personal story. Uh, and also, uh, his, uh, Jim Henson's daughter does the, uh, afterward and she talks about how it plays on the themes of one of his early short films because this is before this is before jim henson and muppet show and all that stuff this is i think this was um i thought he met jerry jewell while he was doing the muppet stuff uh i, I seem to recall it saying in there that he wrote the first screenplay of this in like 68 right and the Muppet Show wasn't until the seventies. Yeah, in sixty one he met Jerry Jewell. Okay, and but he had actually been doing uh, well, not the Muppet Show. He had been doing puppet puppetry. Shows yeah, he had been doing puppetry since fifty four. This, this would have been before. Um, this would have been before the Muppet Show. So, mm -hmm. this is actually when he's building the people that would eventually be the puppeteers on the Muppet Show, like Frank Oz. Um. So, are you building people? Is that what you said? Building the team. Oh, okay. He's building. You can build a team. I thought he like built people. Like we. No. I was like really impressed. I mean, well, I mean, he, he did. did. Like, yeah. You know, guy smiley and all that shit. Like uh, Sweetums. Uh, Sweetums and uh, Waldorf and Stadler. They're people. They are. They are people. They're people like. Yeah. That's they're real, right? They. Uh, yeah. Actually, me and Frank are Waldorf and Stadler. Oh. No, I mean, like, The Muppet Show's a documentary, right? Yes. Okay, yes, yes. I thought so. I mean, it's, like, it's so lifelike. It was... I'm, I'm going. I'm going with that. <laughs> so, it's a magical world where frogs talk and pigs talk and they fall in love. Uh, so what do yeah. you think about it, Chard? Um, well, first I wanted to note that the hardcover is beautiful and also out of print. So if you want a fantastic hardcover, you should go search out the out-of-print hardcover because the reprint is going to be paperback. Oh, okay. That's unfortunate. So, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately for your wallet, the paperback will be affordable, well, the, yeah, so you should get it. But the the hardcover is gorgeous, so I, I would kind of recommend, if I mean, read it first, maybe. But um, I think the hardcover is worth the extra money. I don't know how much it is now that it's out of print, but um, it shouldn't be crazy expensive. I mean, the <laughs> book was popular, but it it isn't you know a huge mainstay yeah, a lot of might, people's you might have to uh stock some ebay auctions yeah. or find a used bookshop or something but, to really get a good deal yeah but it's something it's something to keep your eye out for and yeah. snap up if you can get it yeah the hard the hardcover is gorgeous um i i really enjoyed it i enjoyed it uh from the point of view of like you know as someone who enjoys film a ton um it was really interesting to see an adaptation of a script that wasn't confined to the way that we think about time. So in film, you're kind of, it's the experience is happening to you. Like yeah. you're beholden to the time of the film. But for me, I, I have, you know, a lot of trouble sitting through a whole film sometimes just cause you know, I have ADD or whatever. And I just kind of like need a pause and get up and go walk around. And so having, being able to read at my own pace through a movie cinematic experience was really interesting and freeing for me. So it was kind of nice that I could read it as fast as I wanted to. And it actually kind of reminded me of, uh, reading manga a lot because there's a lot of stuff that happens in Japanese manga that is 
action or kind of outside the realm of dialogue, set up panels, and the speed at which you read those is entirely beholden on how much you appreciate the art in those panels. Mm-hmm. Because if you take a lot of time and you know look at all the intricate details, then you can spend a lot of time on a panel with no dialogue. But if they are drawn in such a way that there isn't a ton of detail there for you to comprehend or investigate you can just blow through those panels really quickly. And so something I noticed upon my second or third reading of, of the book was um, Ramon Perez uses line weight and color and uh, his medium, the medium that he's using, to speed up and slow down time. So there's establishing shots where he is walking through the desert and he is just like fully painted, drawn, yeah. immaculate, and there's so much detail on his character. But nothing is happening in that panel except he's walking. And it's just kind of like lets you dig into that panel a little bit and be like, I'm reading this panel for a longer time than I'm reading the panel right before it, which is just a very thin line weight pencil blue and white drawing of the desert. So I'm inferring that more time is passing during this panel and like kind of deciphering like how time is working in the book uh, was really interesting to me. And it also kind of reminded me of very... Um, a very literary work, like mm-hmm. something like Italio Calvino, where it's you're not really sure what's happening sometimes because it's meant to be ambiguous to make you think about what's happening to the characters. So I, I found myself just kind of not unsure of what was happening in some panels, but being completely okay with it because the character himself is unsure. Yeah. And so you kind of share in the characters like what the fuckness of the whole story because the story begins he's thrust into an adventure and he's given no like there's no preamble there's no like now you must undertake a quest to fight the seven dra-. it's just like here's a key here's some shit like go follow the map right but don't trust the map and you're like okay what the what is happening and the character is having that same moment of like i have a 10 minute head start from what like what is happening and so i i, I was able to share in a lot of the characters experience in the book And not having a lot of dialogue really lets you dig into Mm -hmm. how the pacing of the story works. So I found it really interesting from that standpoint. Um, It's not, like, one of my favorite works, but I think it's a should read for anyone that enjoys comics as an abstract medium and also comics as how unlike film they are, Mm -hmm. but how cinematic they can be at the same time. So, like, if you like film and comics like this is a great book to just kind of like dig into for a little bit it i think is, that that might be the perfect word for it is abstract yeah it's incredibly abstract but it's very cinematic and it's very cinematic in uh like a cinema it's it's abstract in a very cinematic way yeah like this is very well you can tell that this is a screenplay and i think that it, there's a great job done of preserving that feel it's something stuff happens and i don't i mean i'm this is just supposed to be my brief whatever, but I guess I'm digging into this pretty hard right now, but there's stuff that happens in this book that I wish happened more in more mediums, and by that, it's something that I often talk about about video games, and not to get off on a huge tangent, but we're playing a, a video game in a virtual reality world that we've created and, and can do anything in, essentially, because they're, you know, up doesn't have to be up and down doesn't have to be down, and most often, you just see a video game that emulates real life that just emulates you know a real world physics situation where it's like you you have a gun and you're shooting at guys and you're walking on the ground and you go into a building and that building is the same size on the inside as it was on the outside and in this book it really plays with like the physicality of the world Mm -hmm. because he opens the little outhouse and much like the TARDIS it's bigger on the inside and there's like a whole saloon in there and then it just kind of melts into the ground like an elevator elevator, and then he's in a bar later and he opens a door and it takes him to what easily could just be a different time period because it looks like an abandoned city he goes into the bar goes through a specific door and there's like people there so is he traveling in time is he traveling in place is he traveling in like there's so much there that's just being played with with your mind that is like how unlike the real world can this possibly be the cement mixer that just mixes up a single martini there's so much like absurdity built into the world is really, really interesting. And the kind of shit that I love, like there's a humor there that I love, and much in the same way as in Venture Brothers season one, episode three, I think, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Magic, 
where Brock <laughs> is inside the machine that makes him all his wildest dreams come true, and there's like a cowboy riding a T Rex with flamethrowers, <laughs> and like a scuba guy driving a motorcycle where a polar bear is like manning the machine gun. There's just like there's an inherent humor in absurdness. Yeah, and absolutely. it like this book has that, and so the humor and the serious elements to it like play really well off of the stuff that I'm just like really interested in, like abstract absurdity, and it's really fun. One thing to note, I wanted to touch back on uh, when you mentioned that it was very literary, um, is that, I, I mean, I know that we've talked about the art being cinematic, but I th feel that it's important that uh, to note that each of these pictures really is a thousand words. So when you're reading it, even though it doesn't seem like it, it really is as if you're reading a novel. Like, that's... I mean, because even without descriptions, you are seeing literally thousands of words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's 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 its own medium. You know, it is exploring its own medium really well because, in the same way that a book is so different than a film, where in a film they'll show you like Hogwarts Castle or something, and in the book they'll tell you about it, and you have to make up the rest. Right? right? There's like these leaps that your mind has to make in a novel. And there's the leaps that your mind has to make in comic books, too. Like, from panel to panel, you have mm -hmm. to kind of fill in the blanks. And so I think that this book leaves a lot of, you know, a lot to the imagination is, like, you have to kind of fill in yeah. where all the blank space is. Well, you have to project. You have to read this book with intent. You can't just kind of breeze through it. Yeah. And this is not, like, reading Batman where you're going to pick it up and just be like, oh, okay, Batman swings and kicks the guy and then he punches him and he falls off a roof and then he drives away in the Batmobile. You, you really have to put, you really have to read this with intent. And I think it reminds me a lot of um, the Frank stories by, um, uh, I can't remember his name right now, which are very, they don't have any word bubbles for the most part. And they're all very, inc they're all incredibly, incredibly surreal uh, and you're kind of, you know, you read these stories and, uh, some of them are very short and you're kind of at the end, you have to figure out what the story was trying to tell you because there's no description. There's no, there's no dialogue to tell you what's going on. You have to read it with intent and you have to put a little bit of yourself into it because my interpretation may not be the same as Chard's yeah. inter you know, interpretation, which may not be the same as Cade's interpretation, and Toby's wrong interpretation. <laughs> oh, is this the part of the show where I shit all over the thing that this everybody is, likes, where you try surprising to. no one? This is where you try to, but I brought an umbrella. Uh, I actually have something to note before. No, Cade, you go, go ahead and tell us what you think yeah, about what it. Yeah, what you think about okay. it? Um, okay. While I did like this, there were some things I had a problem with. Um... Though, like, not a big problem, it's, you know, it, it does make you think a lot. And some of the things that I was really interested in, I wanted to have explained, and the fact that I couldn't, and then when it's over, there is no more. And so, like, so some of the things you really do have to go into your imagination to try to figure out... And for some of those, I really wish there was some kind of explanation. I mean, like, even if it's not in the book itself, maybe in an afterward, like, or I guess not even in an afterward, but maybe like an essay of, you know, somebody who picks it apart. And, you know, I, I'd be kind of interested to read that because I don't really know what to think about all of the stuff that happened. And that's almost exactly where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I I really didn't like let me, let me let me back up for a second. I came into the book expecting a Jim Henson story and I didn't get one. I felt like it was incredibly sparse, like I wanted there to be an actual story going on and after page after page after page of no dialogue where I didn't really have anything to ground myself in kind of time or space, I just feel felt really lost and futile, and I wasn't sure where I was going or why. Like, I, I was very, very disoriented throughout I most of this story. That's, that's I think that's point. a strength. Well, and that's the thing, is that I think the thing that you guys like about it is the thing that I don't like about it. 
and that's not that's neither good nor bad it's just yeah. my take on it and as i approached the end i got the sense very strongly both that this was obviously um jim henson jim, jim henson earlier in his career mm-hmm. you know a less sophisticated storyteller i mean i've just watched labyrinth again recently mm-hmm. And I could, like, this really does feel like a Jim Henson story, but it feels like a very early Jim Henson story. Excuse me a second. Um, And the other thing that I got out of it is I really, really want to see this movie. Yeah. Because it it really does feel like the script to a movie. And I would, I think that, like, I could picture in my head, like, every scene, like, I could see how Jim Henson would do this. Mm -hmm. Like I can imagine the puppets and the special effects and all of these things. And I really wanted that. And I felt, felt like the graphic novel version was missing something that I expect from Jim, Jim Henson projects. Mm -hmm. Like I want, there, there was, there was something missing that I really needed from this story. And well, I've been having a hard time putting my finger on it, on exactly what that is. And you guys have all hit on different aspects of it. Like, and I really like things that are abstract and kind of surreal. Mm-hmm. And like, there's all these mysteries. And hey, something really crazy happened. I wonder what that was all about. But like Cade said, like there are no answers. Mm-hmm. And it actually reminds me a little bit of a comment that my brother made to me a while ago about the difference between a mystery and an enigma. And what makes a good mystery story is that the mystery can be solved. There are clues that you can use logically to determine what happened and ultimately be proven right or wrong. Whereas with an enigma, it's just something crazy that happened where there are no explanations. One of the reasons why I was really unsatisfied with Lost, especially in the later seasons, is that it became apparent that it wasn't a mystery. There were, were no real answers. There was just enigmas on top of enigmas. Yeah. And that's really unsatisfying to me and it's what and was unsatisfying to me about this book in particular. It I think that something that I think hmm. is kind of a strength of of the story is making you feel lost. Yeah, you really, know, like, really do feel lost. It, it, I, I, mean, think, I, I think the strength of this book is is forcing you to come up with your own like And I I feel like I might have a very different reaction to it. Even now, if I sat down and read it again, having known what the ending is. Yeah, and I, I did, like, and interestingly enough, the ending is also the beginning of the story. Right, which is so also, it for lends, whatever reason, really bothered me. It lends itself like so that. well to just going back to the beginning and reading it again in the same sitting. Um, See, I really liked the fact that we were going along with the character. He didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what was going on. The ending was the beginning of... I thought that was really cool. Um, and I, I really did like the book, and I would recommend it to a lot of people, and I have recommended it to a few people um, just in the few days since I read it. Um, but I, I just do feel that there could have been more. Like, Yeah, I mean, even I, I want to read the screenplay like really badly because I was just like, oh, I wonder... Like, this is obviously... Um, Ramon Perez's interpretation of a Jim Henson project. So it's, it's not just, you know, one, one person's single handed, um, storytelling technique. Like this is someone interpreting someone else's storytelling technique. And that always things change. I'm sure there are things that are slightly different from the script or played out differently in the script than they did in the visual medium. So I feel like it, it leaves me wanting more too. But, and I think, you know, I want to see this movie too. I want to read the screenplay too because I think there's more there and I think there's more to be had. I don't necessarily think that I need that, but I think it would be cool if it was there, you know? Like if there was a movie, I would go see it. If I had a copy of the screenplay, I would read it. Do I need that to make this like a good or bad story? Like not really. It would change if I read the or saw those things, it would definitely change my interpretation of the book though. Definitely the way that this story plays with setting and characters it begs to be a movie yeah well i but i don't i mean the thing is this um i'm not exactly sure when it was but uh there's a famous director named 
Um, uh, Bunuel. Uh, Luis Bunuel. And he made a movie with, I want to say it was Dolly, called Unshan Andalu. And basically it was their attempt to try and replicate the surreal nature of what a dream was. So you get a bunch of like disjointed images and a bunch of weird stuff happening and a bunch of things that don't flow into the next. And you could watch that movie 50 times. You're never going to get an answer other than what you tell yourself. That's what this movie would be. And, and that unsatisfies me. And I think that's, I think me. that, that the interest, the most interesting thing about this book, I think is that it really goes to the kind of person you are. Like this is to me, I read that and I'm like, that's life. You're not always going to have access to answers. You're going to have to tell yourself what the answers are and be satisfied with that. And that actually reminds me of something. You liked Inception, didn't you? I did. I didn't. Well, you liked Avatar. Well, that's that's irrelevant to this discussion. <laughs> no, it is relevant. Because no, it's, it it's, it's very irrelevant to this discussion. But the point, the reason I bring up Inception, first of all, I, I read this really interesting article where scientists gave a mouse false memories and they called it Incepting. This is like real science. It's just this just happened. But completely aside from that, um, Inception is a movie that does not give you answers. It gives you questions and lets you come up with your own answers. Yeah. And I think that the story does the same thing. Well, it's that uh, we you brought up Lost, and <clears throat> I think there's a quote from someone on the design, or sorry, not design writing team of Lost that says, you know, whenever we close a door, we want to create, we want to open two new ones. And whether you agree with that statement or disagree with it says a lot about how you like your stories to be told. Because personally, I think that's a shitty way to write I a story. I absolutely think, and I don't think this does. I don't think it opens, I think that for every door it sort of closes, it sort of opens one new door. Like, I don't feel like it ever branches into like, here's eight new things that could possibly happen. Like, it's always very single-minded. It's like, this thing happened and we're done with that now. Cement truck is now gone. Move on to the next weird thing. Like it's very right. singular in its well, nature. The thing, the thing that you need when you do that that Lost didn't have is a spine, like right. a central thesis of the story. And For I think sure. that this story does have a central thesis. It's kind of buried. It's kind of obscure, but it is mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's like it's like maximum storytelling of a very minimal like story point yeah. you know like there's only one thing that really well, my, is like the conflict in the story and is that there's a guy chasing this other guy my well, my my interpretation of the story is that it's really about creative imagination i mean you could imagine that the story is taking place in somebody's mind mm -hmm. you know or i mean it really does track with the metaphor of making a movie in the same way that a lot of people were comparing the story of obsession, uh, Inception to being about making a movie. Right. And all of the different uh, elements of a movie production. Right. And comparing that to being like in a dream, mm -hmm. which is to say that you're kind of in, in this infinite space and there's all these ideas and they're bouncing off of each other and they sometimes become jumbled and one thing's happening and then something else is happening. Right, and there's you know there's obviously layers to the production, like the further you step back from things, and yeah, no, I think it's it's like, a decent there, analogy. There for are a lot of good things happening here. I'm just not convinced that this is the best possible presentation of those ideas. And I think what would be really interesting is if more artists took a crack at the screenplay, because every single artist storyteller that's going to tackle the screenplay is going to tell it in a different, in way. A different way and i think that would true. actually be like a really interesting thing to have like oh this is you know ramon perez's version where you know like let's have another artist do a different version of the same story and an even difference you know because there's so much left to interpretation here i do want to say this before we do get too far afield as i was reading it the first time like i was really caught up in interpreting the story and so I didn't pay as much attention to, like, the individual art and the way that it changes over the course of the story. But the art in this book is incredibly good. Yeah, it is. Incredibly, incredibly good, especially his use of negative space. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I wanted to touch upon, because um, you mentioned, you know, that sometimes it's about making a movie. And it reminded me of the time in the book where he stumbles upon the people making a movie and he doesn't realize it. But the director of the movie was actually Jim Henson. And I'm wondering... Yeah, I just had that page open. Uh, I was wondering if he actually put that in the script that he was making a movie inside the movie. Well, I, 
I mean, I, on, I, for me personally, what I get from this is the main character's journey is the one that everybody takes. You want to go out and do something, and you have people that are like, well, this is the way I did it, or this is the way you could do it. And that's like the map, right? The map is mm -hmm. like, oh, this is the way, go out. But then you can't trust that map. That worked for me. It may not work for you. Yeah. And in the end, like just his journey through the different pitfalls and stuff of just not just a creative endeavor, but he, what he wants to do with his life. Mm -hmm. Him trying to, to figure out where he needs to go and what he needs to do. And how you start off with no instruction. Nobody's there, especially when you want to do something new, especially when you want to do something that hasn't been done before, when you're trying to, like, blaze a path. Mm -hmm. you're, you're walking out into a desert, and there's going to be all kinds of shit you have to deal with to get to where you want to be. And in the end, you realize that the only person you really have to please is yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, any any story about innovation in any regard is full of like, well, these were the pitfalls, these were the failures, like, here's where we got off course, here's where it didn't work. And then there's always that great redeeming moment of like, and then it all came together and now we have this new thing or this new film or this great invention or, you know, a new business model or something, you know, like something always comes out of that trial and error system. and. I, I find this story is, like, really analogous to a lot of things. Like, there's, like, you could basically implant kind of anything over the top of it. Yeah. Because there isn't, a, there isn't a ton of depth to, like, what's really happening is that a character is trying to go a direction and another character is trying to kill him. Right. I, um... And a character that turns out to be himself. Well, but is he trying to kill him? Well, he shoots at him. The first time he sees him, he, he shoots, shoots at him. him. But he misses him and he I mean is that on, I'm not convinced that's on purpose yeah I I well, often there's... wonder if that's well he shoots something out of his hand the match he's going to yeah. light the cigarette because the whole book and this character is trying to smoke I a cigarette I love the, the, the denial uh, I love that uh, that um, delay of gratification of the cigarette I really it's one of my favorite parts of this this story that it reminds me of um, Hudson Hawk, <laughs> actually, if I can reference a movie that largely is derided, but I love uh, Bruce it's Willis. Bruce Willis. Yeah. I know Bruce, a lot of people love that movie. I fucking love that movie. And uh, the whole thing, Bruce Willis is trying to get a latte. All he wants is a cafe latte it's all, or a cappuccino. All he wants is a cappuccino. And four or five different times throughout the movie, he tries to get a cappuccino and he can't. And so the end of the movie finally gets his cappuccino, and it's a very fulfilling thing. It's like, all right, the story is done now. He has his cappuccino. And that was... We, uh, go ahead, Kate. That was actually uh, something that kept me involved in the story, was trying to figure out when he was going to get that cigarette and what was going to happen next to keep him from doing it. That, that was something that drew me in because it was... Um, it may not have been, like the main part of the story but it was consistent enough that it kept me involved right the, the more we talk about this the more I feel like it's a question of expectations mm -hmm. and I feel like I went into this having the wrong expectations because this isn't a story it's it's very abstract it's yeah. an idea that's kind of being expressed but it's not really like there's not a character arc even like i mean again it depends on like how deep you want to read right. into it and, and i feel like imprint. i want joe to like remind me in like two or three months to read it again with different expectations and see what i get out of it i think that that often can, times our 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 expectations can ruin art like very yeah. quickly and i mean i use the term yeah. art loosely but i mean like film books television movies video games like what absolutely. you expect going into it can absolutely ruin something that's great none, well, of, none I, of the characters even have names do they? No, no, uh, no they do only in the design and in the script right well i mean right, they need to be okay. referred to yeah. in the script, but like in the, script, the villain is just called eye patch yeah even in the script he's just called eye patch i i feel like another problem that i i feel like i was when i read this for the first time it was Okay, I, I was able to deal with it a little bit better because I had had experience with the, um, oh my 
God, I can't. Frank Woodring. That's his name. Uh, he does the, or no, Fred. Uh, what, no, God, his last name is Jim. Jim Woodring. That's his name. Ha, ha, ha. He does Frank comics. He does this, like, like little anthropomorphic cat. And he lives in this very strange uh, place. And I, I had read those before, and I discussed them with people. And I had experienced that dissatisfaction at the fact that, like, well, this is what I think is going on, but really, what the fuck is going on? But, you know, we kept doing it. We kept talking about it. And more and more, I realized, you know what? It's okay. Like, my interpretation is what I'm going to get. So let's make it the best interpretation I can possibly get. And I read those stories, and I read them, and I read them, and I read them. And eventually, you kind of come up with something. And especially, one of the reasons I wanted to discuss it is to kind of be able to more further like kind of flesh out this idea of what this is because I feel like we are not trained to do this society does not train us to read something with intent and say oh I'm going to tease out these ideas because they're what speak to me mm -hmm. and I think that actually that's largely when you talk to your friends about that or something that's something that like pretentious snobs do when they're talking, they want to sound like, that's not really, right? That's like, we're not saying, oh, you didn't get this. They're saying, let's talk about the ideas in this, because that's what art is, right? Yeah. That's what media is. That's its ideas. It's all about ideas and exchanging those ideas. And I think that is the basis for every conversation the four of us have ever had. Oh, absolutely. Sure. I, will, I also think there's something to be said, though, about art for art's sake and just like having it hit you in the face and go oh okay and then moving on because yeah see i'm not a fan of that oftentimes yeah, yeah. no it's like i i think that it's it's an important part of the of the in industry quote unquote industry of the, of art movement in general is you know if i look at a painting and it does zero things to me that's fine like that's right. totally fine to not be impacted by something at all and just look at it and say that's interesting because to you it might not mean anything because it's not for you you know the art was never for you the art m most of the time uh is a, is about the process you know it means something to the artist it means a thousand times more things to the artist than it could ever mean to anyone that looks right. at that that's painting that's true and so that's the concept of like art for art's sake is not it's not really for art's sake it's for the artist's sake right. you know like they had to get that it was like every fiber of their being made them paint that picture of whatever they painted. And if you walk by it in a museum and you just see it, experience it, and it does nothing to you and you feel nothing and you walk away no different, that's fine. Like that, you don't have to take something away from everything. Yeah. Like, I think that's okay. And so I read this story and I had fun. Did I learn anything? Not really. Did it change my life or like affect me in a huge way? Like not, not, not really, but I enjoyed it. And you know, like, and that's something that's just, I think sometimes important for us to remember about art is like, it just I, happens. I guess that I have a very sharp limit of what level of abstractness I'm level, I'm willing to accept. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this brushed right up against that wall. Yeah. Well, and the hilarious thing to about me, uh, the, the the most hilarious thing about that to me is is one of our favorite books. One of the things we agree with, uh, other than Transmed, is The Invisibles, which is one of the most freaked out, fucking abstract ass stories. But the thing is, it's the difference. Not, it's, it's it's surreal. It's sur right. Okay, it's not so, abstract. Yes, it's, it, yeah. well, and that's the thing is that like that story that comic has an incredibly deep and complex story yeah. it's just almost incomprehensible on the first read you have yeah. to read that comic like 18 i'm times. gonna say at least five or six times before you really start to tease out what the story is but once you do that the story is there and it's incredibly deep and rich and meaningful and i believe that i believe the same is true for here i just think that you're adding an extra and I don't want to say like level of difficulty, but an extra layer of abstraction because you're removing the words, which is the thing you interact with most directly. Right. And that's, and that's what I'm saying is that I, I feel like I definitely have a wall when it comes to how much abstraction I'm willing to deal with in my, in my art. Well, right. I mean, is there, and this brushed up against that. 
But I mean, as a counter argument, like, is there really that much there to this story? Like, how much depth is there really? I don't think there's plenty. Is as much depth as you want to add into it? Well, that's true. That's that's, that's, absolutely true. It's like, it's is it there or are you implying that it's there? I I wonder what you would get if you sat down and read the screenplay. Yeah, yeah, totally. My question to you is, what's the difference? I mean, if I I think the difference is huge. There, I think if I do see it's there, then it's there. I think there's a huge difference between someone explaining to you an intricate plot story complicated spider web of events in through through the course of a story like and laying it out to you and you having to read it like a couple times to figure out like what exactly is there and a very i i don't want to call it bare bones but a very minimalistic story plot like there is in tale of sand and you're now feeding that information into the book. Like, what you put into it is all that is there. Where a complicated, intricate story with layers of plot that you have to un- uncover, like, I don't, I don't want to use Game of Thrones as an example. It's the only thing I can think of that's long enough <laughs> to have, like, a lot of, you know, shit be referred to from earlier books and, like, right. the, pl- the dominoes falling, there's a, there's you know? There's actually, if you look on fan sites, there is an incredible amount of detail in the Song of Ice and Fire books. Yeah. That, like, you have to tease out from oblique fucking comments that right. people make thousands of pages apart. Yeah, and I... Like, there's shit where there'll be, like, one line where somebody will say, like, oh, yeah, it was this guy and he was wearing red. And then, like, three books later, there'll be, like, some other random-ass line. Like, oh, this guy has this one red shirt. And yeah. it's very fucking hard to put those things together. And then, But, I mean, the fans actually have done that. Right. And there's, like, this entire other fucking dimension of shit that's going on that if you're just reading the books as, like, a casual reader, you will not pick up on it all. Yeah, and I think that... I mean, <laughs> I use that as an example because there there is stuff that is, like... Happens in the very first book that is still yet to be fully uncovered. I just picture a wall like Martin has a wall in his castle that's just slips of paper with like names or descriptions jotted on them and strings that are just connecting them I, to all I, each I, other. I, I really... like how you assume that he lives in a castle. Well, well of course he does. Of no. course he does. <laughs> uh, what's of actually really does. funny is uh, George R. R. Martin has a lot of trouble keeping track of all of the details. So are there these guys that he calls that are fans? When he's like, "Hey, what color was those? Was that character's eyes again?" And they're like, "They were blue." And he's like, "Okay," because like he lit like there's just too much going on in his head. So like, and in an interview, I saw him talking about this. Like he has this this fan network network that like keeps track of all his deets for him because he like really just can't remember them all. Which that is... actually reminds me. I wish I could remember the name of the story. Um, but I was talking to my mother about Game of Thrones at one point. And she was like, she told me a story about a book that she read when she was a teenager is a science fiction story it was one of those where there's like 40 different characters and they're in like 10 different places mm-hmm. and she talked about how like three quarters of the way through the book she got really confused as to who was where and doing what and so she actually went back to the beginning of the book and started taking notes mm-hmm. and she realized that it wasn't that she was confused it's that the author fucking forgot that one character was in a particular <laughs> place and put them in a different place without ever like having them intervene that territory like yeah authors I mean, are fallible no i and and when you have a story like that i can't i it's it would be so easy to lose I track wonder of if a stephen character king did the same thing because stephen king is always making references to other books and like you'll be reading needful things and he'll refer like he'll reference three books in one book and it's all like stuff yeah, that's happening in his, his universe. entire universe is supposedly connected yeah no it is according to not it is. not all of it but a well, lot of it is because he has the dark tower books and then he um like in the actual pages where it lists other novels, he will bold the ones he considers companion novels oh. that do take place in the same universe or have even just the briefest mention of a character from the Dark Tower series. There's, I'm, there's I'm reading my first that. Stephen King book right now. Which, Which one? one? I'm reading The Shining. And, oh, good uh, luck with that. Really? You have fun it's, with that. It's really interesting. It is not at all what I expected of a Stephen King you novel. You just have fun sleeping after reading that. Okay. I, I don't think I've ever read a Stephen King novel. Oh yeah, I, this is my first one. I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised I've never read one before this, to be Salem's honest. Salem's Lot is is uh, the first three books he wrote. Uh, Carrie, oh, if you don't count The Dark Tower, or The Gunslinger, which was, I think, one of his first ones, but he didn't publish it until later. Uh, Carrie, which is awful. And I don't mean awful written. I mean, like, awful. Makes you want to, like, open a vein. 
this uh, Salem's Lot also makes me want to open a vein. And The Shining, which, well, like, I did not sleep well after reading that because it's fucking awful. Yeah, there's some already... And I love... The Kubrick's adaptation of The Shining is one of my favorite horror movies, just oh, movies yeah. in general. How many uh, How many books are there in the Dark Tower series? Seven. Seven. There are, well, actually eight because he just uh, recently brought out book 4.5 it's just it's kind of a, a story that roland is telling them that happened when he was younger i mean I wonder, if you want to collect if it, i everything. could read the entire thing before the next george martin book comes out you probably could yes yeah, I mean, there are seven have, books like, there's seven I, core books in the dark tower series then there's the talisman and black house salem's lot there's the but i, I wouldn't read i mean the talisman is just good he wrote that with peter strom and black house connects directly to the Dark Tower universe. Yeah. And then there's the... And it's the flat-out sequel to The Talisman. Yeah. The Sisters is something that's in uh, uh, everything event, Everything's Eventual. But the, you, all you need to get the story is the seven books. I wouldn't even read four books. I'd say eight. Because he wrote, it, <laughs> he wrote it afterwards, and I'll guarantee you that it's not as good. All right. Well, we've gone pretty far afield at this point. Well, anyway, the, the point the point what I was making was like there's a lot there's something very different between a complicated interweaving story like something but you asked like a sci-fi about, fantasy you said story, is depth. and I said th- something where you have to imply your own depth. Those are like two very different things. Like I yeah. think that you're not implying any depth in the world of George R. R. Martin. Like he's already created all this depth, but this story has depth by having a lack of depth. I don't think complexity is the same thing as depth though like something that's very complicated can be hard to understand but because it's so complicated Mm -hmm. you can't really tease anything Mm -hmm. out because it's all already there i guess i don't mean depth depth is like shit you can fucking dig into you know i think i mean i guess density is like yeah i I, maybe that i wouldn't but yeah i i think at a certain point though like i mean you say it's like okay it's so simple like you can just keep digging into it Mm -hmm. but at a certain point you aren't digging into it you're just coming up with shit on your own exactly that has nothing to really to do with the story like that's just all in your head right but i see i don't i don't think you can make that distinction like i think that's the purpose of the story is to like get you to kind of say all right well this is what i think is happening and then you can either you can either go into the text and be like well this supports what i'm thinking or you can go into the text and be like, oh, I'm completely fucking wrong. Right. And you the know, thing is that there's, there's not really much in the way of text in this book that you can point to to back up a point about, oh, I think it's about this and I think it's about that. Like, going back to my previous example of Inception, like, there's enough material in that that you can keep picking at it up to a certain point. But even beyond that point, like, you're just making shit up basically like well i think this means this and i think it means that and the two interpretations are equally valid yeah and i well i i think we were talking about uh uh, watsonian versus doyleist doyleist and i think that there's certainly a point at which you can be like oh i thought this was i i what i think about this is this and you can be like well show me in and when i say text i mean the book show me in the text where you're getting that idea from and you can be like oh well that's just something i feel and it's like okay well that's you know really interesting or whatever but that's not what we're talking about like i think there's plenty of shit you could dig into inception where you could be like well this scene right here supports right and that's what i'm saying is that with the tale of sand like because there's so little text there for you to dig into like you very quickly reach that point where it's like well show me in the book where you're getting that from and but the like, image, well, the I images are the text. I do that's, think that there's enough, a, there's enough like, subtlety there that there, there are. I mean, every panel essentially could support yeah. some new theory. I mean, and I think that that's that's great if you want to dig that far into it. But again, if it if it's just something you want to read and like have a, the experience of reading from beginning to end, like that's perfectly valid as well. Yeah, I, and I think that I, I really think this is one of the few. Uh, books that i would say just read it for the art because yeah I, I mean it's enjoying it's it's something that can be enjoyed just on that level it's that fucking pretty yeah i mean forget forget about the story for a minute you can just read it as an art book yeah that's yeah. absolutely gorgeous it really is very very good. and just like a kind of a master class in storytelling because like the way that he uses panel work to mm-hmm. imply motion and yeah. speed and even as I was just flipping through it here at the table, there's one panel where he's using two different art styles in the same panel. Yeah. 
like to represent two different kind of frames of reference. Yeah. yeah, there's a scene where he's looking at a limousine and his reflection in the limousine is very highly detailed and kind of uh, it's colored very like uh, in, in very like evening colors and the window rolls down and inside it's this very kind of cartoony like fine line art and it's really the distinction as the window rolls down is really cool. And he does that throughout the entire book. And also his just how he draws action is really interesting and intense as well. So yeah. as an yeah. art piece, it's fantastic. Now, one thing I wanted uh, to note, because I think it's worth consideration, is knowing Jim Henson's other projects, um, one of his goals with Tale of Sand could have just been to spawn conversations exactly like this. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean you're... Yeah. You're an art. You want to make movies in the '60s. Your, the your influences are going to be a lot. You know, they're going to be filled with jump cuts, and they're going to be filled with, like, weird surrealist kind of uh, undertones and things. And so, yeah, I think that to me is the purpose of of good media. You know, good comics, good film. They should inspire discussions. Because if if you're all just sitting around, it's like I love to watch Commando, but what are we going to fucking talk about concerning it? How awesome it is. Well, yeah, besides how awesome and homoerotic it is. <laughs> that, that actually is a point that I'm, I'm not sure if I actually made when I first uh, started talking about the, the story, but this is very much something from the 60s. Mm. Like, it has a very late 60s feel to it in the way that nothing really feels certain. It definitely feels like a product of its time. Yeah. It was an interesting time in American history. Yeah, well, in film history. <laughs> and, and, and film history as well. There was a lot of crazy yeah. shit going on. I've been watching too much Mad Men and Mad Men criticism. Ah, uh, just... Uh, well, let's not go Don, into that. Don Draper. So, yes, read it. I yeah, mean, I, I think, think that's what we're saying. I think more than read it, just experience it. Yeah, ex- I, I yeah. agree with that. Ex- Look at it. Yeah. Observe it. Yeah. And uh, the hardback is only going for a little less than, it's going for 25 bucks on Amazon. Oh, did you just but, look at Well, it? they're out of stock right now, and it's oh, yeah. entirely possible that they will not get any more in. Yeah, that's in which what case, I'm thinking. <laughs> so the guys, list price is 25 The list price is 30 The list price is 30 on yeah. Amazon, it's going for twenty five. So, but they're out of stock. I'll give it to you. You can find it on. I have a sneaking suspicion that this will never go back into print as hardcover I, in this same format. I don't think so either. So the paper with the paperback coming out, it may be a while before you see a hardback. So if you see one, snap it up. Yep. Do well, it. what you what you do is you buy the paperback cheap, and then you have it rebound as a hardcover on your own dime. Or you buy all cheating. of the hardcovers that you can find and wait like a year and then sell them all and then they'll reprint the hardcover like right after you do that. Yeah, it's and right, you'll just, right before. Well, hopefully you sell it before they reprint it so that you may you get rich. Develop those latent psychic abilities that you've been working on because you'll need them. One thing I'm afraid of, um, because I, I do plan to buy the, the paperback of this when it comes, comes out because I have a feeling it's going to be a lot cheaper, which I'm a a comic book reader on a budget. Uh, but one thing I am afraid of though, is that, uh, the paper and the way that it looks inside this hardcover, I don't think can be reprinted in a, in oh, a yeah, paper the paperback. Bag. Well, well, I don't think will be as high. One of the nice things about this book is it's on very heavy paper. I actually, a very nice edition. I just saw an Archaea press paperback for the first time because I haven't, most of their know. stuff is printed it's, in it's hardcover, hardback, yeah. and it, I saw the first paperback, it's and good. it was in. It was great. It looked, oh, okay. it looked great. Go. So I, I don't think the quality will be any less. I think the size will be smaller though. Mm-hmm. So I think that the hardcover is just a good size it's, for the it's art. It's a good buy if you see it. Yeah, yeah. I Jump pretty much that. demanded everybody read the actual hardcover, not download it or or anything like that, because I really wanted the full impact of the. Uh, uh, <laughs> of the art, Joe just, I felt. gave I gave away what I was gonna recommend. <laughs> and now the recommendations. <laughs> Sorry, I, I try to hide them lately. I, I think you just volunteered to do your recommendation first. All right, I'm gonna recommend a book I've recommended on the show before, but a long, long ass time ago. Uh, especially in real time, I think it was like four years ago. But in, <laughs> in show time, it's you know it was like 
I don't know, fourth or fifth episode, I think. I don't really remember. But it is uh, Marvel Comics, uh, Next Wave Agents of Hate, uh, written thing, by Warren Ellis and drawn by Stuart Inman. And yeah, this, this trade, they put out a trade that's the whole thing. I'm pretty sure this is the third time that that's been recommended on the podcast. Yeah, I think... I think I recommended it, like, on my second or third episode yeah i guess i just want to talk about it at some point maybe i should stop bringing it but no you should definitely keep bringing it. yeah i don't i mean sorry readers you're only getting three new recommendations this week but this book is so fucking good that i can't help but bring it again i waited a while but like i just the book is insane for all the right reasons it really like it's just Everything you love about comics in the way that they just punch you in the face because awesome stuff is happening all the time. There's humor, there's action, there's violence, there's really obscure Marvel Comics references. Like, there's all the stuff that, like, comic fan, comic fans, like, really appreciate in this. And I just... There's also a Suicide Girls plug. And there's a certain amount of irreverence and just, like changing things about comics because it makes for a more interesting story not because it makes sense or has anything to do with that what actually happened yeah i think that sometimes when people try to tell an extreme or you know so non-comic canon comic story they go for the dark gritty heavy two-fisted approach to the story and i think this is a great example of like where you can there are other outlets for that let's take our comics from you know just a kids superhero level to something way beyond that is you don't always have to go to the dark and gritty sometimes you can go to just the absurdly funny but also insane realm of humor and irreverent there's a lot of irreverence there but there's also a lot of love for the marvel universe there because the references are like they're there because he's read this stuff you know you he there's great uh we talked about earth x is a great earth x jab in here where they're talking to Aaron Stack, the machine man. And they're like, <laughs> oh, just because you think you talk to the Eternals, like, makes, you, or not the, the Celestials makes you hot shit now. And it's like, I, that's because, you know, Warren Ellis has a reverence for, like, what's happened to some of these characters. I feel like, um, if Edgar Wright made comic books, this would be his version of the ultimates i really yeah. feel yeah like in the same way that like Shaun of the dead is his version of a zombie movie and hot fuzz is a version of a cop movie this would be edgar wright's version of the ultimates and it's it's it's, excellent. it's so good. awesome the art is phenomenal yeah, Stuart like, Immerman just absolutely knocks it out of the park oh, no, and yeah, when awesome. Stuart Immerman left next wave agents of hate to work on ultimate spider-man they asked warren ellis like oh what's the next story and he said when Stuart going to be done with what he's doing because he refuses to do this book without Stuart Immerman for good reason because and you know what I really kind of feel like 12 issues is exactly the right length like we were talking before we turned the mics on um, about some of our favorite like TV shows and cartoons and stuff because there's some very big holes in Cade's uh, catalog of things he's seen yeah we're going to start a TV show we talked about was Firefly was the right length and there was some argument there, and I'm not going to go on either side of that discussion, but um, the argument, I think, can be made. Like, it did 13 really great episodes, and then it was done. And I think that Next Wave is an example of it did 12 absolutely phenomenal issues, and then it was done. And I'm okay with it being done, because those issues are great. I'll read them time and again. Mm-hmm. They'll always they'll always be as good as the first time I read him. Yeah. They ended on a and, high note. And it, I never have to worry about somebody else coming along and driving it into the ground. Well, and the other thing is, you know, if something else comes out, if there's another Next Wave story with Ellis and Immerman and it's awesome, like, that doesn't detract from the fact that, like, if it did end here, and it kind of did, you know, like, these stories are still great. Like, if right. more happens to come later, that's awesome. But without it, it's still an amazing series. And... I yeah. was not left wanting for anything at the yeah. end. I of mean, the I want this book to just be coming out forever, I, I just because like I lo- I love it that yeah. much. But I'm, I, it's, it is a great length, and it doesn't leave, like, it doesn't just end in the middle like a lot of Ellis stuff. Like, well, yeah, there's things I'd like to see him write more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, oh, many, how many oh, times? Oh, oh, oh. Fell. How many times on this podcast have we talked about like, I wish that this had more issues. I wish yeah. that they explored this more. Like, I wanted something else from this that it, I didn't get. 
Yeah. Next Wave doesn't do that at all. Yeah, it's fantastic. It doesn't I, I don't really back. know how to pitch it, except that it's like a superhero team of C and D list Marvel characters that have been drafted by this new shield like organization called Hate. <laughs> What's the director of Hate's uh, name? It's Dirk like Dirk Anger. Yeah. Dirk Anger. And director, director, director of Hate. Director which, of Hate. And he just kind of. anti terrorism effort. Yeah, and they just fight like aliens in Dormammu and crazy shit like that. No, it's it's Rourke Ranu. It's not even Dormammu. No, it's not? Oh, okay. No, it's, no, it's Rourke, like Dormammu's Rourke, like shitty net. Rourke Ranu or something? <laughs> yeah, it's the dimension of. The dread. dim dimension. The dim dimension. Uh, yeah. I just read it recently. Yeah. So. It's uh, incredibly good. It yeah, it's awesome. Good. I, I, that's a shitty pitch that I gave, but it's really it's good. Yeah, that is a shitty pitch, but if you want a better pitch, go back to one of the other episodes yeah. where we already pitched it a lot better than that. Yeah. And then read it. Edgar Whether Wright doing the Ultimates. How is that a shitty pitch? No, I just, I think that we, I mean, I don't know. It's an awesome really comic. It's, it's about, but yeah. That's okay. It's not really it's about, about any. It's about being awesome. Yeah, it's no, not really about it's anything. It's about mon- monkey wolverine clones. It yeah. is. And broccoli men. And drop bears. It's it's awesome. Drop Read it. Bears. Okay, so speaking of bad pitches, because I'm horrible at pitching books, um, my book I brought is uh, Superman, Batman, Supergirl by uh, Lo- Jeff Loeb, Michael Turner, Peter Steigerwald. Um, it's... And this is the 2000, like 2006-ish? Four, maybe. 2004, maybe. like when they first brought Superman back, Batman back as a title. Yes. Yeah, yeah this is 2004. Okay. Um, and it is basically reintroducing Supergirl to the DC continuity post-Infinite Crisis where she had this completely other... Identity was this ectoplasmic being. Yeah, I I, I think you mean Crisis on Infinite Earths because Infinite yes. Crisis wasn't till like two thousand and seven. Crisis yeah. on Infinite Earths. They're, they're... But yeah, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, Super Kara Zor El was not a character. Correct. There was I, what was it? At? I always wanted it's Linda Danvers, right? I, I always I want believe. to say Carol Danvers. Yeah. But there was the Linda Danvers Supergirl. There was uh, Matrix Supergirl. Like there was a bunch of Supergirls, but never Kara Zor El. And Never is, Superman's cousin. Right. And this is Kara zor back for the first time since, like, 1986. Correct. When she died in, in Crisis on Infinite Spoilers. <laughs> of a 25-year-old <laughs> book. <laughs> Almost 30. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I, so It's only one of the most famous covers in all of comics. Ever. Yeah. Yeah, right? You should know that. Yeah, so... Yeah, if you read comic books, you've seen it. It's Superman holding her as he... Yeah, spoiler A character that was once alive and then died and then was alive again and then rebooted is was, was at some point dead yeah um but yeah the reintroducing <laughs> her to the dc universe um it's told from both uh, batman and superman's point of view in the genius way that they did superman batman with the reboot um great storytelling Phenomenal art. Um, it was uh, one of Michael Turner's last before he died. It was, well, I guess not. Wikipedia showed it as 2006, but I guess since it's 2004, it was like four years before he died. But, but yeah, it's just great. It uh, always has a space in my heart. I have two posters on my wall that were the variant covers, so... And just looking from over here, is that Superman Batman Volume Two? Yes. If yes, it is. For the trade, the first one is Public Enemies. So yeah, they don't put yeah. numbers on them anymore. Well, it has the number on it yeah, right now. The, but, okay, yeah. So yeah. Superman Batman colon Supergirl. Supergirl. Yes. Right. Yeah, and it's issues like six through ten of Bat- Superman Batman. Eight through thirteen. Whatever. <laughs> this well, is the storyline where Batman like <laughs> this fights Dark Side, right? Uh, yes, they made a movie of it, uh, an anime. They did, and it's excellent. It's it is fucking excellent. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Yep. It's a storyline and a comic that I've always meant to read and never have. Oh, I. So Michael, whether or not we vote for it, I think I'm going to see if I can borrow that from Cade. Yeah. I I really like this story, and I was really happy that it happened because Supergirl pre New Fifty Two was one of my favorite characters. 
as everyone knows, I like the kid superheroes that like don't need to be superheroes but decide to be superheroes anyway right. because I think that I find that story really compelling. And she has a great relationship with um, Stephanie Brown, yeah, who we talked about. Actually, Brian Q. Miller. I have not read this story, but the like the last two years before the reboot, uh, I was actually really getting into Supergirl and Batgirl for the first yeah. time. And she has a really interesting relationship with all of the Teen Titans because she appears in some of those and with Damien when Damien appears. So she's a great character to read about. This is a, a really, I think, an excellent origin for her. Much better than the New 52 origin, which was completely unnecessary, shitty, terrible, gross, awful garbage. Although from what I understand, Bat- or, uh, Supergirl is one of the less reprehensible New 52 titles. It was... It was the first six issues was as far as I got, and it was completely pointless. I've, I've heard some people saying good things about it more recently, Yeah, but I haven't actually gotten the wherewithal together to actually see if it's any good. Also, I love this costume and not her new costume. So. Her new costume's kind of awful. I don't. Her boots that have no knees. Yeah, it's weird, man. I mean, I get uh, it. They wanted to, like... You know, what's weird is, like, they wanted to sexualize her less with the costume, but they made it more awkward. Right. Like because if she were wearing pants, like if they just colored her legs in, it would be completely different. Because she's wearing like the Wonder Woman bottoms, but it's like a she's wearing like a one piece swimsuit with long sleeves and a cape, and it's yeah, really bizarre. It's really and weird. this costume is the classic, almost the classic costume of the skirt and top well, it's costume. Midriff bearing. They just put a midriff in there, and her skirt's not red anymore; it's blue. But well, it was blue for a long time, and. It- the silver age i'm just thinking of that like classic cover where he's <laughs> carrying her and she's right the, it was yeah. red later on but originally she wore i think all, like her entire outfit was, was blue the, except for the red boots yeah. yeah so i i really like this costume i think it's classic i think it's just like a good look i like the long sleeves i think it makes it look cool <laughs> that's, I, one, that's one of the things that just absolutely blows my mind about the new 52 reboot is that Right before that, like they had actually gotten things back on track and were doing really well. Yeah. And had some amazing books out. And some amazing. Which were completely negated by the new 52. Yeah. And you just felt like, oh, well, I just wasted some money. Yeah. I really love this story. I think the art's really great. And. I see that's. I hate Michael, Michael Turner, Turner is art. someone that you I, either love or hate. I, yeah, it hey, is. I consider him part of the triumvirate of suck with Rob Liefeld and. Uh, wow. Uh, I think that might be going a little. <laughs> no, far. actually, it was funny because we have a friend and we would talk. And who's the other one? Uh, Silvestri, Mark you Silvestri. You hate Silvestri. And uh, yeah, I I just cannot get behind it. And then he, we were talking about this, the triumvirate of suck, right? And then Michael Turner died, and we felt really, really bad. Um, you killed him. Yeah, and I, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm sorry that a human being is dead, but I'm glad he won't be illustrating any more comic books because I just feel like he's a Jim Lee knockoff. I don't. Just looking through that, I see several problems with it. That I mean, and it's hey, it's Joe, a personal preference, man. Joe, like I'll be the first one to say, you can it, never but. have too many abs. No, yeah, no, you, you can have see too many Batman's abs, abs in there. there. She's like, she's like, like a, fucking what, sixteen, seventeen in there. She's got a fucking whale's tail. You know, it's just like she's Kryptonian. She's you know they age she's quickly. I guess buff too. I like, just I like that they. I mean, like they did sexualize her quite a bit in this book. But we, Toby and I were talking about this before the mics turned on. Is Toby was saying like he draws these like pinup statuesque, you know, beautiful Adonis women, and I, you know, he does the same thing for the dudes though. Like yeah, Batman no, has a hundred and fifty abs. Like, he has forty two chocolate bars glued to his stomach. To see those abs. Like, yeah, my problem with him is totally not the the over sexualization. Yeah. It's that I just don't like his art. That's I and I think that's a that's fair, fine. valid. Yeah, like, I, I have a wrong. very strong reaction to it. Whenever I see it, I'm like, is that Michael Turner? I am now fifty percent less likely to read that book. Yeah, I mean, and, that's it's a valid argument, but you're you're wrong. But it's I'm it's not, valid. It's, Actually, it's funny. The last time I talked about Michael Turner was with Gabby. And I made some offhanded comment, like, there was something about his art that I always kind of enjoyed, and she's like, oh, I fucking hate that guy. Yeah, no, uh, I don't. I mean, she didn't put it in those terms, because no. she's Gabby, and she doesn't swear or anything like that. But she Not was like, in the show. Not in the <laughs> show, certainly. But she had a very negative reaction yes. to her, to, to Michael Turner. So yeah. you and Gabby can go off and have a He's, hate on against I, Michael I don't Turner. see any difference. Yeah. I've actually made it a... I've actually made it a a square anyway. I've added Jim Lee onto that just for sucking at everything. I uh, I love this series though, Superman Batman, immensely. Didn't Ed McGinnis do the first few issues? Ed McGinnis drew the first few, um, still written by Jeff Loeb, and it it went through various 
uh, artists and authors. And and each arc was very different. Yeah. Right. And I have to say, I probably enjoy 90% of it. Like, I think it's pretty fantastic. I love the story. And from looking through that, it's, I mean, I've seen the, I haven't read it. I've seen the animated movie and I fucking adore it. I think it's one of the few animated movies where they weren't, it was like, yes, this is how, this is what it's like when Kryptonian fights, you know, Darkseid. He punches holes in the ground and, you know, it's he lot, moves very, very quickly. And It's a lot different than the movie. Is it? I, I think it is. Maybe that's Like, I me, flipped but... through that, I looked at three different pages, and I was like, these are all pages, these are all scenes from the movie. I mean, they referenced it very heavily, and they actually tried to draw the, the series to kind of emulate Michael Turner's style. But, yeah. You know. They made it look better. Anyway, it is what it is. <laughs> I I think that you should not only read this Superman Batman trade, but actually all of them. It has some great, and it also is uh, something I love about the DC universe is the relationship between Superman and Batman, and I think it's really strong. And yeah, we look forward to that being ruined in the new movie. I yeah, I, yeah. something I, to note I, about the I, Superman I, Batman run is. I actually got out of it right before the issue 26 where, you know, Sam Loeb died and they yeah. had the... Wait. No, Sam? his son. Oh, right, yeah. Died and they had all those writers and artists come on and it is almost impossible to find that issue if you want to buy it. I think it. I have two... I might have two copies of that because they did two variants. They did one with Superboy and one with Robin because I think those... I think if that's the same issue... It's, it's like a Superboy Robin instead of Superman Batman for that mm. issue. Huh. And they did like two covers and huh. I, those are two of my favorite characters. So I think I might have picked those up. But um, yeah, I, I think the whole series is great. It has one of my favorite is a, just a two issue arc in there where Batman and Superman meet up with their like alternative universe. Like this alternative universe comes they like connect oh, is that the one with uh, batwoman and superwoman no it's well that one's a really good one too but this one is like it's like they're little batman they're like little cartoon batman little cartoon mm. uh superman and like batman is talking to little batman the little like kid cartoony batman and at some point he's like i'm the gosh darn batman because like <laughs> you can't swear at him and he like the origin story is the joker or somebody like pushed his parents down and they <laughs> fell down and he like wanted to avenge them and that's why he became batman and then the little batman is like isn't that what happened to your parents and the other batman's like yeah yeah that's because he didn't want to, like, blow his little Batman mind. And also, he's, like, at kneecap punching level. So at one point, he punches Batman in the knee and just yells kneecap as he does it. And oh, my God. Amazing. You have to go find those two issues. They're hilarious and really good. Are they in the Jeff Loeb run? Or are they... I, they're later. They're, like, in the 50s, I think, uh, of this series. I but... to yeah, I have to read the whole fucking series. It's tonight. good. You should. I, that's my recommendation is for the whole series. Go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so initially, I was also going to uh, bring back something that I had recommended before, because after we did uh, the Hawkeye episode a few weeks ago, I actually sat down and read the rest of the Hawkeye series since then. It's up to issue like 12, I want to say. And I really enjoyed it. And you, if you haven't read it at all or haven't read more than the first trade, it continues to be incredibly good. But it put me in mind of... Matt Fraction and David Aja's previous collaboration, The Immortal Iron Fist, so good. which is actually the first thing I recommended on the podcast on like episode seven. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't end up bringing that though. Uh, you should read it if you get a chance, but that's not my recommendation for this week because I was looking through my sh shelf when I was talking to Joe earlier today and I realized that something that I've been meaning to recommend and apparently never have. Um, the book is Fafford and the Grey Mauser. It's an adaptation of the uh, classic sword and sorcery series by Fritz Leiber. And it's written by Howard Chaikin, which is I hadn't realized before and only noticed as I was looking through my bookshelf. Howard Chaikin being the guy who wrote Bite Club, which we reviewed um, like last, last episode. Yeah. Um, and it's, dr it's drawn by uh, Mike Mignola, or penciled by him, excuse me. Uh, in addition to that, uh, inks by Al Williamson and colors by Sherilyn Van Valkenberg. Awesome name. Um, so yeah, if you're not familiar with Fafford and the Grey Mauser, it's one of the major influences of Dungeons and Dragons. It's 
your classic D&D sword and sorcery world. It's Fafford, who is a barbarian, and the Grey Mauser, who is a rogue. And they have adventures, mostly around the city called Lankmar. Yeah, Lankmar, which is also the inspiration for, in part, uh, of um, Ankh-Mor part, Pork. Ankh-Mor Pork. From uh, the, Discworld series. the Discworld series. So there's there's a lot of things that, that have been influenced by this series. And this comic adaptation is really, really well done. It's some of the most classic Fafford and Grey Mauser stories. Mike Mignola's artwork is incredible. Um, it's really kind of weird and different from what you get from a lot of even modern fantasy comics. Like, mm-hmm. Liber was writing these stories, I think, back in the 60s and 70s, and it really shows and just kind of some of the ways that this is kind of just weird and Cthulhu-influenced, and there's a lot of Conan in it. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, it's really reminiscent. If you like the Conan Dark Horse stuff that's been coming out or any of the original Conan uh, comics, you should definitely pick this up because I think you'll enjoy it. It's very dense yeah, it's, in a great way. It's about six issues, and it's just like a bunch of random stories of them having adventures. Yeah. I, I really enjoy that. It's, it's well. the thing that allowed me to appreciate Mignola's artwork. Because I tried reading Hellboy a number of times and could never really get into it. And this is Mignola still doing his same style, but really kind of toned down from what he does in Hellboy. Yeah, it's a I lot found different. it a lot more accessible. Yeah, it's also not at all like the stuff he did in Cosmic Odyssey either. So That's it's like true. a totally yeah, different totally. shade of Mignola. So uh, it's I, I really like this story. Joe, what'd you bring? I brought um, something a little different for me, uh, and it's mostly because I knew what other people were bringing, and I didn't want to compete. I brought, uh, but this is a great graphic novel. It's called The Influencing Machine. It's by uh, Brooke Gladstone, and it's illustrated by Josh Newfield. Newfeld? Uh, And basically, it's just her going back over the last, like, I mean, the media, and basically, like, talking about it. And I really like it. It's written, it's it's drawn in like black and white, and the only color they use is like this kind of teal. It's very calming. I would call it mint. Mint. Maybe a mint no. Maybe maybe a mint. Maybe a mint. From over here it looks like kind of a sea foam. Maybe a sea foam. We'll go with sea foam. Uh and uh basically she's a reporter and she she just walks you through the history of the media in this country and um basically kind of confronts the idea that there's some kind of influence or bias in the media and her basic thesis is uh well there is and it's yours because you make like they're making the news for us we're the ones watching it so they're they're catering to what we will watch and so it's not really the media that's biased it's people's bias right so uh, it's really interesting, and it's done really, really well. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and it, it definitely made me feel better about the state of the fourth estate in this country. It's just uh, journalism and the news and, and, and stuff like that. She's incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, it's got some great... Like on the front page, she's got uh, excerpts from Alison Bechdel and Scott McCloud, who are both like... Pretty pretty big in the independent graphic novel mm-hmm. community. Is is that Alison Bechdel well, of the, the Bechdel, Bechdel test. test? Yes, it is Alison Bechdel of the Bechdel test and Dykes to watch for, and Fun Home and Are You My Mother, uh, Fun Home, which is uh, a story of her growing up with her father, who she suspected was gay, uh, which is amazing. Uh, really, one of the best biographical comics I've ever read. Uh, beautifully illustrated. I will most likely bring it in to recommend one day. But uh, it's it's just good. It's good and it's informative. And I thought I'd pull a chard. And uh, I mean, I don't have any informative manga, but I have this. And I thought it'd be interesting <laughs> to bring in and just kind of get it out there because I thought it was really good. And you learn something. I actually read Project X Challenger Seven Eleven today, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad that we uh, we didn't actually talk about that on a podcast. Yeah, really? 
That would have been a very that would have been a challenging conversation to have. Uh, yeah, so I'm not gonna lie. So with this, I'm fully <laughs> expecting this not to get picked. See now I, that makes me want to vote for it see, because I, you're being all like dissembling and mopey and like oh no we're just no 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 I'm, book, honestly, so I'm just gonna like, bring crap because nobody's gonna pick it anyway. No 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 you misunderstand. I knew what you were bringing, <laughs> and so I didn't, like, I originally had planned to vote on Fafford and the Grey Mouser, but then somebody brought Next Wave, and I really <laughs> feel like that's what we need to talk about next time. Um, yeah, this this sounds awesome, and I would love to read it, but it, it does sound like a thing that would be difficult for us it would to, be talk, very difficult I mean, to talk about. I mean, I definitely want to read it, though, and it's a great yeah. recommendation. Um it's, oh, well, I, I'll make you, you recommended first, so I think that Charge should vote first. No, I vote last. I'm the tiebreaker. I think that you should no, vote no, this. No, 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 no. You vote, vote first? We go, we go around. I, I, I think that we can make it an official rule that whoever votes last has to act as a tiebreaker. Yeah. Okay, that well. Can be the, that can I'm be the official rule. so uncomfortable with voting first because that's it just like blows my mind. Like, my vote <laughs> counts for something. <laughs> what are you doing? It's a special um, treat for you. I, this is really difficult. A really difficult pick for me because... Um, I haven't read the only one I haven't read is the influence <laughs> the influencing machine, which is I'm hesitant to pick just because I think it would be a difficult conversation. I really do. So I'm so. left with Fartford and the Gray Mouser, which I absolutely love, and Batman Superman Supergirl, which I absolutely love. So, um, God, why wait to put me on the spot, guys? I don't even like think about what I'm gonna vote about because I vote last. Um. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Feel the hate flow through you. My evil plan is all coming together, making you actually have a vote that counts. That's so bizarre for me. So difficult. I want to read both of them. Can we do that? Is that a no, one? Um, You're welcome to borrow both of them. Yeah, well, I already read them. Uh, as much as I love Superman and Batman, and I love Supergirl, and I love this story, and I love this character, and I love this art, um... I think I'm gonna go with Far from the Great Mouser because it's dense. There's like a lot there, and there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. And I think it's a fantastic influence on the rest of the industry of fantasy. Um, you know, and if you're a fantasy fan, I think you should read it. And I think there are not enough fantasy comics I out agree. there. So I think this being one of the best ones, we should probably talk about it on the show. So I'm gonna pick Far from the Great Mouser. Great Mouser. <laughs> well, that makes my uh, my choice simple. Because I don't have to worry about like upsetting the apple cart, so I'm gonna vote for next wave. Oh, oh well, I'm now Joe vote, wanted to no, vote I'm for next wave. I wanted to vote for next wave, but I will vote for uh, Fafford. All right, Fafford and Sons. Uh, <laughs> and just as a note, I believe that uh, after this episode, we're gonna be moving from biweekly back up to uh, releasing episodes weekly again. Yeah. So Did, wait, uh, were we ever releasing episodes weekly? When, when we were first releasing the backlog, we were releasing the oh, weekly, that's but right. nobody was listening to it then, so nobody knows our oh, terrible yeah. secret. That was, but uh, yeah, we talked we about it, that. and we decided that we're we have so many comics that we want to talk about that yeah. we're going to move back to doing it weekly. My and terrible I, secret is that I'm a hermaphrodite. So that's terrible. That's about not that. a secret. Everybody knows that, Joe. Oh, you need to well, wear more <laughs> pants. <laughs> you those, need to warn me before you come over. You know, through my window. Those jorts. A little uh, revealing. They're, they're cutoffs. They're, they're not little, shorts. They're a little revealing. So I'm sorry if that strains your already overly taxed comic book budget, but uh, then yeah. the breaks. Well, you know, it's not like you could just get a hold of them by other means, so and I don't feel bad for you at all. We do still have a bonus episode. Well, not a bonus episode. Our long run is coming up. Yeah. Uh, mm. And not next month. Isn't it next month? Did, so, we, did September, we say September? I thought it was or September. Or October. Uh, well, I'll we have to go back and double okay. Check. We had talked about this should be off the air probably, but <laughs> <laughs> we had originally talked about doing it every three months, right and then months. later we decided to do it more frequently. Well, if we're doing it, quarter, we'll we'll do an announcement before yeah. it comes out. Yeah. Okay, because we're also we been this talking out. about doing another ladies' night. So yeah, we should definitely do that. But the next uh, uh, book for the long run, in case you forgot, is uh, Empowered. Yep, yeah. Adam all, Warren. All seven volumes that have been released thus far. Yep. So, yeah, keep so reading that. Look forward to that in a month or yeah, two, two or three. Or we're eight. not, we're eight. not eight. sure. At some point. You don't know. You only and, know when we give it to you. And for next week, check out uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser. But like That's, every uh, week. Fafford, F-A-F-H-R-D, just in case you're trying to Google oh, it. Oh, yeah. Fafford. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, I'm sure you could just type in and the gray Mauser and it would. Yeah. Or Fritz Leiber or yeah. Mike Mignola. Or your mom. I don't think Wait, that. Don't do that. That one might not don't work. Don't make sure a safe search is turned on. Don't do my mom. You meant off, right? What? You meant off, right? Oh, whatever. I mean, I guess. All right. <sighs> Good night, everyone. Uh, oh, and like every week, just read all the books. Read yeah. everything. Yeah. All right. And we'll uh, we'll see you guys next time. Have, don't have too much fun. All right. Bye. Bye.